Gene Moss, and I'm way up here, so I can see all of y'all back there. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> it's called a calling together. We do it in our churches, we do it in our homes, we do it at our parties, we do it everywhere today. We are going to do it and you're going to get up out of your chairs now if some of you are like me the reason i'm really pushed up on this stool is because i can't walk it's a, you're supposed to laugh <laughs> oh that's good because it's funny on some days it's hilarious and on other days lord why <laughs> but, so but if you can get up and if you cannot get up uh, folks that do get up, go behind the chair of somebody who's sitting and just be there because you have to get up. And I have certificates on you. I know who can get up, and I know who can. Yes, I do. Uh-huh. Let us break bread together. The standing today will be our bread. Standing together. Standing here at Porter Phelps Huntington Museum, standing here on the grounds where six people spent their lives in service to the folks that lived here. They didn't have a choice. No, they didn't. They were property. But today, they are being honored for the services that they gave, and that counts. It counts big time, and you can applaud. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Let us break bread together. Let us stand together, even for a moment, even if we don't know one another. Let us just stand together. Mm -hmm. Jack. Yes, ma'am. Remember back in 85, you were just a baby. <laughs> were you even born? <laughs> just barely. Jack, in 85, Michael Jackson and Lionel, uh, Lionel Richards uh, 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 put together a group of folk from everywhere. And what did they write? Let me hear USA, we are, they put USA in front. They put the country on notice. We are the world. We are the people. And so, as you walk as you can, not too far from where you're sitting, just stand with somebody that you've never met before. Jacqueline, will you help me do this? We are the world. Will you help me? She done moved away from me. We are the world. Same, y'all, same. Keep moving, keep moving. Keep moving. Give your hand to somebody. Yes, look at somebody. Yes, we are. Keep moving around and looking good. And whoever's sitting down, stop by and give them a touch. We gotta keep walking. We gotta keep walking. Doesn't it feel good? I see a woman standing with a program in her hand and pretty blue blouse on. If I was close to you, I would touch out to you. That were the same color. Oh, I around. Hello. And, and, and then Bob Marley came out We're with what? Nice One world. Yeah. <laughs> One heart. Let's get together and be all right. Let's just and let's just narrate that kind of jazzy life. Okay, here we go. Bob Marley. One look. One heart. One heart. Let's get together. Let's get together. Let me see. Take that little dance thing. Just a little bit. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> That's it right there. Come on now. Did you hear it? Did you hear Reverend? Did you hear Reverend? Go ahead. All right, now they're going to harmony. Oh, we know there are ups and downs. Keep on singing. We know it. We know. But we're not going to give up. We don't, we're not going to give up the fight for everybody to be free. We never will. They say the came out today and you're preaching to the choir. Well the choir is that choir rehearsal and every time the choir comes to choir rehearsal they get better and better. Come on choir. Yes. Yes. And, and Marty went through he didn't think you had stood up long enough. Get up, stand up. Stand up. Stand up for your rights. That's right. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Get up, stand up. Come on, choir. Get up, stand up. There it is, come on. Don't give up the fight. Get up, stand up. Stand up for not just your rights, but for the rights of folks that right now are oppressed. If you got a little bit of privilege, use it. 
to help. If you got a lot of privilege, get busy. Use some of it up. Because you can't get in heaven if you got all your privilege all packed up. All right. Get it up. Stand up. Uh-huh. Stand up. Uh-huh. Stand up. Uh -huh. I heard that back there. And so we bring it full circle. Sister Jackie. Yeah. Do just another verse of break bread together. Keep standing, y'all. Keep standing. Uh, uh, praise God. Yes. Together. On our knees. Praise him, praise him. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees. to the rising still do more. There's always more. Blessings require giving. Every time you even think you're blessed, and you are blessed all the time, even when you think you're blessed, just give. And it will come back so fast and so much, you wonder what happened. And what happened is you. What happened is us. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. My name is Onawumi Jean Moss, and I'm glad to be in your orbit. <laughs>
she's still standing, we have coming to us Ms. Anika Lopes to do the invocation. Good evening. Good evening. I welcome you on behalf of the Porter Felt Suntington Museum and Ancestral Bridges, supported by Mass Cultural Council and the Mass Humanities Reading Frederick Douglass Together series. I am Anika Lopes descendant of the first black and Afro-Indigenous families of Amherst, I bring you greetings from the West Side National Historic District, the West Side, the Jazzy Side, <laughs> survivors of enslavement and genocide. It is my honor to gather again with Onawumi Jean Moss, Jacqueline Wallace, Reverend Carlos Anderson, Shirley Jackson Whitaker, and welcome Frank Roberts. Mm -hmm. Distinguished ambassadors of culture, spirit, education, the art of activism, renowned storytellers. As we bring forward what can only come through the ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. I would also like to acknowledge my mother, Deborah Bridges, who is here today, a champion and living testament who were displaced to and from the Connecticut River Valley, as well as those who came from the South, including her great and second time great grandfather who were enslaved alongside Frederick Douglass at Rye Plantation in Maryland. I also want to honor my first and second grade teacher, Miss Carly Tartikoff, who's yeah. with us today.
ancestral bridges that connect them to the six lives enslaved at the Porter Phelps homestead. We have returned to stir the ashes. We have come to uplift six lives who faced the ultimate betrayal to a price tag on their humanity. We have returned to stir the ashes. We have come to uphold six lives neglected like a fire unattended. We have returned to stir the ashes. Six lives whose energy filled every inch of this space, fills every inch of this space. We have returned to stir the ashes, felt in the breeze that uncovers a glow of ember. See it. We have returned to stir the ashes. We have come to honor Zebulon Kurt, Caesar Phelps, Margaret Peg Bowen, her daughters Rosanna and Phyllis, and granddaughter Phyllis. We have returned to stir the ashes, Margaret Peg Bowen. We have returned to stir the ashes, Margaret Peg Bowen. Stirring the ashes, lifting Peg's voice. Please remember me. Please remember me. Oh Lord, please remember me. I am owned. I own nothing. I have nothing. I am a slave. I return here today to spend a little time with you all. Although my birth name was Margaret Bowen, my father called me Peg. He said I had a way of holding things together. I often have wondered what happened when his peg was torn away from him and there was no longer a peg. I can still vividly remember the cries and screams that our enslaved community showed when I was ripped away from them. They stood helpless to save me. They too were slaves. They too were helpless. I was purchased in 1754 by Moses Potter, Porter, that from Joseph Smith and brought to 40 acres in Hadley, Massachusetts. I was a 12-year-old made an orphan by the cruel act of selling human beings. At this 600-acre farm, I was expected to wash, cook, clean, make fires for cooking, and babysit the master's children. 
At times, my hands were so raw and bloody from using the rub board to hand wash all of the clothes for the entire household. Mm. I also had to cook for the family, but also making ash cakes for the, for the field hands, although they were a few. We had many more field workers when I, where, from where I came from, many more. I made the ash cakes at the end of my long day so that the cakes would be available for the slaves before they went to the fields the next morning. After a long day, it was tough to make the cakes, but it was something I knew I had to do. I used the ashes from the wash pot that I had used to wash the clothes earlier. I found some joy in making the ash cakes because that brought back sweet memories of me with my mother. She taught me how to make the cakes. She explained to me, you got to make those patties and you need salt, water, and flour. Making those patties would be put directly into white hot ashes. Not cold, not the white, not the gray ashes because they tend to be too cold. It had to be the white hot ashes. She stressed making these cakes was so important because this may be the only food that some of the field slaves would have for the entire day. Whenever she was able to slip a piece of salt pork or salted fish with the cake, she would give me a wink and a smile. It was her way of letting me know how special and important that little act was for those that were enduring so much. Sometime I was known to other plantations. When I was only 14, I left 40 acres to look after a slave that had given birth and to take over some of the domestic work at that household. This did not make any sense to me. I was barely a woman myself. What did I know about birthing and babies? <laughs> the work and expectation at times felt like it was more than I could bear. I would have given anything to just grip my father's hand and to look into my mother's eyes. I felt weak, sad, lonely, and helpless. Others in the slave community tried to comfort me. They always assured me that they would be there as long as they were there. There was a freed black couple living in Hadley, Margaret and Ralph Wales that wholeheartedly assured me that they will always give me their best. They, along with the slaves on the plantation, knew too well the pain of being taken away from your loved ones. I worked very hard for over seven years when I realized at 19 the sick feeling that I was having was because I was pregnant. The new possibility brought joy and song. Joy that I would someday have a little one that was a part of me. Sorrow that I would not have the family unit that my parents had even as slaves. Nevertheless, on June the 2nd, 1761, God sent a little angel into my life. When I looked into her eyes, I saw my mother's eyes. Because of that, I named her Rosanna, which, were, which had been my mother's name. I would call her Rose, as my mother had been called. As I heard, as I held her in my arms, the first thing I did was to squeeze her real tight and kiss her tiny forehead. Then I sang the song that my mother had sung for me so many times. My little girl, you would always be. It doesn't stop if they take you from me. I love you from the sky to the sea. You are God's gift to me. Mm. I could tell right away that she was smart and curious. She brought so much joy to me. 
I, I regretted that I had so little time to give her. When I had time, I taught her how to make dolls out of grass, as my mother had taught me. When I knew it, she had six dolls lined up against the tobacco barn. She quickly learned how to plait the hair from grass roots and make the dresses out of feed sacks. She was unbelievable. And for the time being, she was mine. As I watched her grow, I had to address the fear that I had to prepare her for the day that she may be taken away from me. After a long, hard day, as I put her to bed, I would sing the song that she sometimes sang, that she sometimes called Mama Peg's song. I wanted her to especially remember the part where I said I loved her. As she grew old enough to understand how to work with open fire, I taught her how to make whole cakes and ash cakes, as my mother had taught me, hoping she would remember me in a special way, as I remembered my mother, her name said. When Rose was four, May 1765, my second daughter, Phyllis, was born. She was named after my father, Philip, for she had his energy and smile. Over time, she did not appear as healthy as Rose, but she had Rose's curiosity, which was a joy for me to see. Rose taught her how to make dolls out of grass and how to sing Peg's song as I had taught her. When I heard them sing the song together, I was moved to tears. I now felt sure that they would always know that I loved them. Although I was a slave, I always wanted a family like the freed Hadley couple. I knew that was a slim possibility for me. What gave me, a slave, the right to dream or to have hopes for a better life? Hmm. I fell in love with an enslaved man named Brooke Morgan. I wanted to marry him and make a family for us with my girls. When the idea was made known, the cruelty of slavery lift his vicious head. The master said that for me to leave with Pump I'd, and go to Vermont, I had to leave my little girls behind. Mm -hmm. I was devastated. They kept saying I had a choice. Although there was a winter chill throughout the house, I could feel anger bubbling through my body. I could tell my soul was on fire. I said to myself, what if slaves had choices? And anyway, if I had a choice, I would take my girls with me. <laughs> that was not to be. Despite the pain of leaving my girls, I decided to go with him with the possibility of me working to gain my freedom and the freedom of my girls. I left Hadley or Bennington, Vermont in 1772. Rose was eight and Phyllis was five. I was sold to Captain Fay, a Vermont tavern owner. I was able to work at the tavern to try to save some money for our freedom. The tavern was so different and exciting. There was always something going on. One day after completing my work at the plantation, I rushed to the tavern. I could not believe my eyes. People were everywhere. They were cheering, laughing, dancing on tables, shooting their guns in the air, and drinking anything they could get their hands on. <laughs> there seemed to be tears of joy for everyone. I was told they were celebrating because America had been in a big fight to gain its independence and freedom from a powerful country called Great Britain, and America had won. They were shouting and repeating over and over again. July the 4th is our day of freedom. July the 4th is our day of freedom. As I stood among them, 
and marveled at the celebration. I saw how happy they were to have their freedom. But I became envious, sad, and discouraged because freedom for me was not to be had. After the celebration of their revolution, I continued to work at the tavern, saving as much money as I could because someday I wanted to be free too. But I slowly began to realize that it was difficult to save enough money to buy my freedom and visit my girls in Hatley. I was close to 70 miles from Hatley, which was impossible to walk. Therefore, when I used money to come and see my girls, my saving was quickly depleted. Those times when I was able to come, I noticed Phyllis was not looking well. She was losing a lot of weight. She was slowly wasting away. It was not clear as to what was the problem. The master's wife, Miss Elizabeth, had taken her to a doctor in Northampton, for which I was so very grateful, but she continued to waste away. Just before I left to return to Vermont, I found out that I was going to be a grandmother. My Rose, now 14, was going to be a mother. Along with this news, soon the twin winds of birth and death blew in our lives like a hurricane. It changed me and my girls forever. Three days after Rose's daughter was born, Phyllis died. Rose named her daughter after her only sister, Phyllis. I was truly devastated that I was not there. But hearing the name that Rose had given her, her, her own daughter let me know that I had at least planted the seed for their love for each other. Vermont ended slavery in 1777 while I was there. But Captain Fay refused to give me my freedom. Well. Mm -hmm. But instead resold me mm -hmm. well. back to the Phelps and Hattie. Mm -hmm. So at the age of 35, I returned. When my granddaughter, Phyllis, who was now three years old, saw me, she immediately asked me to sing a pig song to her. <laughs> I was so moved because that let me know Rose was teaching her our song. All right. She also heard at least she also had at least eight grass dolls lined up in the <laughs> attic where we slept. All right. I could see Rose was a great mother, mm -hmm. and I was so proud. All right. In time, I noticed that Rose did not appear healthy and seemed to be wasting as her sister Phyllis had done. But again, there was nothing I could do. She continued to waste away before my eyes. On March the 14th, 1781, my firstborn beautiful daughter, Rose, died five years after I had returned. In 1784, four years after returning, I decided that I wanted my freedom, and I wanted it now. All right, now. I felt free freedom was really mine when all the slaves were freed in Vermont in 1777. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that I should have never been resold back all into right. slavery. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt mm -hmm. that freedom was mine in 1777, and it was still mine in 1782. Go ahead. So I stood and declared that I was no longer anyone's slave. Mm -hmm. I was free. Mm -hmm. With that, I left the Phelps home. Okay, Although I was unable to take my granddaughter with me, I often returned to see her. Whenever I did, I could see she was wasting away. Mm -hmm. The last time I returned, I could tell she was rapidly wasting away as her mother and aunt had. Hmm. When she saw me, she gave me a weak smile, stretched out her little frail arms towards me, grabbing my finger 
and pulling me closer. Mm -hmm. You know, whispering, she said, pig song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As I rocked her in my arms mm -hmm. and sang, mm -hmm. I could see her breathing becoming more labored and shallow. She was slowly slipping away from this cruel world. Mm -hmm. With tears and a smile, I whispered in her ear, my little girl, yeah. you be free. You be free. To that, her grip on my fingers slowly loosened. And to this world, she was no more. She be free. Mm. My little girl, you will always be. Same, mm. It does not stop mm. if they take you from me. Mm. I love you. Mm. From the sky to the sea, you are God's gift to me. La 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 you will always be. Same, baby. Same. It does not matter mm -hmm. if they take you from me. Mm -hmm. I love you from the sky to the sea. Mm -hmm. You are God's gift to me. Thank you. Return to throw the ashes. Please welcome Frank Roberts. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Can you hear me? Oh man, it is such a pleasure and honor to be with you at this fine institution in this sacred space on today to celebrate and commemorate our beloved ancestors. I want to talk to you today very briefly in the time that I have about two revolutionary men who lived in revolutionary times. Mm -hmm. Two sacred ancestors. The first sacred ancestor was a brother by the name of Zebulon Prutt. And you know, there was something from the very beginning that was special about this black boy named Zebulon. Mm -hmm. There was something I imagined that there was something about him. He just had that extra spark, that, that extra light, that extra je ne sais quoi that everyone wanted to gather around. And so they named him Zebulon, which comes from the Hebrew, which means he who is exalted and prince-like. And he was exactly that. Now, Zebulon Prutt was the youngest son of the Prutt family, which you may know, Arthur and Joan as its mother and father. Uh, they were a family of nine people, two parents and seven children, who were owned by the enslaver reverend Isaac Chauncey, who was one of the town of Hadley's first ministers. And like so many of this town's founding so-called ministers, was an enslaver. All right. And so now when the enslaver, Reverend Chauncey, and it's important to name him that way, when the enslaver, Reverend Chauncey, died in 1745, Brother Zebulon was ripped away from his family. First, he was inherited by Zebulon's daughter, and then he was sold to the Porter family in 1747. And so when Brother Zebulon arrived here at 40 Acres, which he helped to build that home right there, the Porter family recognized very early on that, like I said, there was something special about this young man. And so they began to use Zebulon almost as a kind of showman or, or a mascot for the family in some ways, right? So for instance, when the Porter family was involved in the uh, resurrection of a church in Hadley, they brought Brother Zebulon out to come entertain the people, right? And, and, and Brother Zebulon used to do this thing where he would pretend to be a rooster. And I want you to imagine this. This was a, this was a short brother. He was about five feet tall, so pretty short, especially for a brother. 
<laughs> and you can imagine this young man who would go into the crowd and he would do this rooster move, right? That would make everybody feel good, make everybody laugh. But Brother Zebulon, like all enslaved people, was not interested in simply performing for, enslaved, for, for enslavers in Hadley. Brother Zebulon had his eyes stayed on freedom. Well, and so we imagine that in between these events where they would bring Brother Zebulon out and he would perform his Brewster chicken dance, in between that broad smile he would flash at his enslavers, we know Brother Zebulon was dreaming and scheming. All right. We know Brother Zebulon was plotting and planning. <laughs> right? And so in 1766, 10 years before the end of the American Revolution, 10 years before the American colonies declared their independence, Brother Zebulon Prutt declared his own personal independence okay, right. from the Porter family. All right. He left and got up out of this place. Okay. <laughs> he ran away. And one of the most fascinating documents that we still have is the original uh, runaway slave advertisement for Brother Zebulon, which you can read in your program, which gives us a little insight into what this man looked like and what he was doing. Like I said, he was a short man, mm -hmm. about five feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, and though he was short in height, he was surely tall in character and All charisma. Right. Mm -hmm. They say right. he was a light-skinned black man, and I mean a real light. I don't mean Barack Obama light, I mean <laughs> Mariah Carey light. They said, he was, they said he had a whitish complexion to him, which we imagine actually served as an asset to help him blend and passively pass, mm -hmm. which is why he was able to, uh, to escape. All right. Another thing we learned from the runaway slave advertisement for Brother Zebulon is that when he escaped, he was not traveling alone, we think. And we'll come back to that. He had a native woman with him. And so Brother Zebulon ran away and he was free for 18 months, a year and a half. Unfortunately, his freedom did not last long. We know from the letters of Elizabeth Porter that our dear Brother Zebulon was found, like I said, about a year and a half later, and by 1968, he was re-enslaved, this time by Elizabeth Porter's neighbor, Oliver Warner, who she, who she had sold him to. Did I say 1968? I meant 1768. Okay. This is what happens when you get the ancestors. Sometimes they shake you up in front of the microphone. Now, Brother Zeb also had an older brother whose name was Caesar. Well, let me back up. He gets re-enslaved, right? And Brother Zebulon, just when he thought that all hope was lost, history turned in his favor. Because in 1783, the courts ruled that slavery in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was unconstitutional. And so once again, this time for good, Brother Zeb, as he was called, was declared a free man. Now, Zeb also had an older brother named Caesar who fought, fought in the American Revolutionary War and became a free black man. And so when Zeb was free, he moved from Hadley to join his brother in Amherst, mm -hmm. where the two lived as free men, mm -hmm. well into their 80s, okay. yeah. and enjoyed a long life in Amherst. And so today, as we reflect on the legacy of Brother Zebulon Prutt, well. there are a couple of broad lessons that we can take with us, take with us from this young man's life as models for living today. First, the fact that Zebulon escaped to freedom with an indigenous system, yeah. with a native woman, yeah. unearths a long and important history yeah. of black and brown coalition building well. and critical allyship mm -hmm. that is still yeah. important to this day. Yes, mm -hmm. Brother Zebulon and that nameless native woman must have realized that their freedom and their commitment to liberation was connected and indeed deeply dependent on one another. Mm -hmm. Their story is a reminder of the powerful things that can be, be achieved when people of different backgrounds mm -hmm. come together come with their eyes staying come on free. Come on. But then also when I think about this back and forth of Brother Zebulon's life, this, this from freedom to bondage, freedom to bondage, mm -hmm. seemed like every time he took two steps forward, he was pushed two steps back. Well, seemed like every time he got just a piece of freedom, somebody would take it away. It reminds us so much of this pernicious cycle of American history that we still find ourselves living in the midst of to this very day, yeah. where the minute we get, where it, at this very moment, there are Supreme Courts and Supreme politicians attempting to <laughs> metaphorically and politically All and right, sometimes now. quite literally All bring right, us now. back yeah. into bondage. Yeah. Storytelling time. To Brother yeah. Zebulon as a reminder time. of Truth that history. Telling time. Right. 
truth telling time. But the story doesn't stop there with Brother Zebulon. I want to mention to you also very briefly the story of another enslaved ancestor who was enslaved by the Porter Phelps family here in Hadley, the story of Caesar Phelps. Now who was Caesar Phelps? Caesar Phelps was, like I said, another man enslaved here at the 40 Acres farmland. He was purchased by Charles Phelps in 1770, around the age of 18 years old. And now, whereas Zebulon, we know, at least had these moments of levity and laughter, um, such as the chicken dance moment, Brother Caesar's life was full of misery. We don't know much about Caesar, but what we do know is that they worked this young man to the bone. The conditions that he worked in were so vicious that one particularly brutal season here in New England, and we know how those winters are here in New England. Mm -hmm. Brother Caesar literally had his finger frozen off. Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine that. Mm -hmm. Working in the fields in sub-freezing temperatures to the point that you lose a limb. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's really interesting about Caesar's story is that like Zebulon, he always was looking for ways to assert his agency and leave a record of his desire to be free. What's also particularly important about Caesar's story in the context of this week, as our country celebrates Independence Day, is that Caesar actually fought in the American Revolutionary War. And I want to read you a brief excerpt from a letter that he wrote to his enslaver in 1776. Familiar date, right? It reads as follows. Sir, I take this opportunity to inform you that I don't intend to live with Captain Cranston if I can help it. And I would be glad if you would send me a letter that I may get my wages, for I have not got any of my major wages. And I want to know how all the folks do at home. And I desire your prayers for me while in the SARS. And if you're determined to sell me, I want you should send me my stock and book. Oh. So no more at present, but I remain your ever faithful slave. You know, when I read that, it's so powerful because even though this letter is clo cloaked in the language of submission, there's something about it that seems subversive, right? Come on now. There's Come something on. about it. First of all, we have to remember that this act itself is illegal. So this is a fugitive act. It's simply writing, right? And it speaks to the way in which he had already been well-trained. He had already been asserting his freedom. But there's something about this letter that reminds us of how our ancestors always sought to leave a record of their existence mm -hmm. and their desire to be free. Mm -hmm. The story of Caesar Phelps also serves as an important reminder of the often unacknowledged role that African Americans have played in building, contributing, and defending this country, even in the midst of it all. The story of Caesar Phelps reminds us that there would not be a United States of America had it not been for the unrelenting faith and uncompensated labor of people like him. Well, and so, as our country and our Pioneer Valley community prepares to celebrate the 4th of July, let us always remember the lives and stories of brothers like Zebulon Prunt and Caesar Phelps, who remind us that our so-called American freedoms came with a price that our ancestors well, paid. You know, James Baldwin used to say, our crowns have already been paid for. Uh -huh. All we have to do is put it on. Yeah. And so on the, in the name of Brother Zebulon and Brother Caesar, I want you to stand up. Stand up. And we want to say, we speak your name. 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 People say amen. Amen. of the stones, passing of the stones, honoring the six lives. Each stone has the names, their names on the stone. 
the stones are installed in the stone fence right across from me. And so they are here everlasting to be seen, to be inquired about, hopefully to inspire more, because it takes all of us. Thank you so much for the heartbeat drum. Thank you. <clears throat> Listen to the heartbeat drum, it's their heartbeat. A little louder. There it is. They're here. They're here. Mm -hmm. They're here. Mm -hmm. They're here. So when you look at their names on the stone and the everlasting monument to them with names in stone on a stone fence, remember their names. Jacqueline sang it just a while ago, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Go on, Jacqueline, just another time. Hush, yeah. children, hush. Say their names, say their names. You have them on the program. Somebody say their names, say their names, say, say their names. Yeah. Oh, oh go ahead. Hush. Go on, Sister Shirley, go ahead. Somebody's calling my name. Hush, children. Hush, hush, children. Somebody's calling my name. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. What shall I Bob Marley said, stand, stand, don't give up the fight, stand, stand, don't give up the fight, stand, stand, don't give up the fight. Fire. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, that's what you can do, that's what you can do, that's what we can do. These stones honor the six lives that were here and the others that were mentioned that we know yeah. not about, but there weren't many of them, but if there was one of them, it was one too many. And so, we are here. I want the storytellers to please come forward again while you are standing. Let them know that you heard them. Mm. Shirley Whittaker. to the ancestors. Go ahead now. And sing in Zoom. Doesn't matter if you should jail us. We are free and kept of 
fight by hope. Our struggles are, but victory will restore our lives to us. Y'all getting y'all getting better at it, right? Yeah, we are, we are gonna stand up and fight. Woo! My God! All right, Reverend. The right Reverend. You gonna lead us? My dog. Yes. All right. Mr. President, friends, and fellow citizens, the task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver the 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the state slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. But I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. The purpose of this celebration is the 4th of July. It's the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I'm glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the nation. Fellow citizens, the simple story is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects under the British crown. England, as the fatherland, although a considerable distance from your home, imposed an exercise of its parental prerogatives upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as, in its mature judgment, it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with the sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers become restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victim of grievous wrongs. With brave men, there's always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of the total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling 
ideas, much more so than we at this distance of time regarded. The timid and the prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Their opposition to that then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful. But amid all their terror, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. On the second day of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of lovers of ease and the worshipers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national uh, sanction. They did so from the form of a resolution resolved that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and to this day, you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary, the 4th of July. It is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men, and for the good they did, and for the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They were peace men, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these de degenerate times. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time with God and his cause is the ever-living now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work, and have done much of it well. You live and must die, and you must do your work. Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? Am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions, then would my task be light, my burden easy and delightful. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. 
The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. My subject, then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day from the slave's point of view. Standing here, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. All right. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave, I will dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice, or who is not at heart a slaveholder, shall not confess to be right and just. I fancy I hear, I hear someone of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind? Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your, co your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? I undertake to prove that the slave is a man. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, 
feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow man, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with a, with a, la with a lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters, must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments of my time and strength than such <laughs> arguments would imply. Teaching. Teaching. <coughs> At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ear? I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The, the conscience of the nation must be roused. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And the crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? Mm -hmm. I answer, a day <clears throat> that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. There was not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than the people of these United States. Mm. Go where you may. Search where you will. Search out every abuse. And when you have found the last, Lay your facts by the side of everyday practices of this nation. Well, mm -hmm. And you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, mm -hmm. America reigns without rival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take the American slave trade. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine drover? I will show you a man drover. You will see one of these human flesh drovers armed with a pistol, whip, and a bowie knife, driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children to the slave market at New Orleans. Mark the sad procession as, as it moves wearily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. There, see the old man with locks thinned and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders 
a bear to the scorching sun, her brinny tears falling on the brow of the babe of her in her arms. See, too, that girl of 13, weeping, yes, weeping, as she thinks of the mother from whom she has been torn. Suddenly, you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle, the fetal clank, and the chain rattles. You hear, your ears are saluted with a scream that seemed to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you, you heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was from the woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had been faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tell her to move on. Follow the drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. See men examined like horses. See the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated forever. And never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from that scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where, under the sun, can you witness a spectacle more fetus and shocking? Yet this is but a glance at the American slave trade as it exists at this moment mm. in the United States. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form, and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the star-spangled banner and American Christianity. Where these go, may also go the merciless slave hunter. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport the right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery, mm. and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any two villains is sufficient to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witness for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic, Christian America. The seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty or a woman's liberty to hear only his accusers. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly mm -hmm. inconsistent. Mm -hmm. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power mm -hmm. of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. Mm. 2024. You profess to believe that one blood God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth and hath commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet 
you notoriously hate and glory in them your hatred of all men whose skin are not colored like your own. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet you hold securely in a bondage which according to your own Thomas Jefferson is worse than ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizen, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad, it corrupts your politicians mm -hmm. at home, it saps the foundation of religion, and it makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. Be warned. A horrible reptile is called, coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster, and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. Allow me to say in conclusion Notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented, the state of this nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I therefore leave off where I began with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains and the genius of American institutions. My spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let every heart join in saying it. All God God see the day, the day when, when human blood shall cease to flow. In every kind we understood the claims of human brethren, and each return of evil for good, not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end, and change into faithful friends, each foe. Prophecy. Thank you. 
attention to the words of Congressman and civil, civil rights leader John Lewis, saying when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. And an ancestor Bob Marley, who's been with us all throughout this evening, <laughs> thinks every man, person, has the right to decide their own destiny. And in this judgment, there is no partiality. To divide and rule could only tear us apart. In every chest, there beats a heart, and soon we'll find out who is the real revolutionary. Let us also hold true that any liberation that parallels genocide and enslavement is not revolutionary. Let us be revolutionary today. Let us remain curious. Let us see each other and fiercely defend and uplift and protect humanity. Revolution is always bigger than any one of us, and we will need all of us together to get there. We hope you will carry this experience, what you've learned or revisited, with you every day. I'd like to give a special thank you to Karen Sanchez Epler and Elizabeth. Anglin, thank you so much. Thank you for being our people who are responsible for reaching out to us for gathering us together in the year. And Susan, and Susan, are you here? Um, and also would like to extend a thank you to Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker for adapting her Ashes to Ashes to stir the ashes here and honor Zebulon Caesar, Peg, Rosanna, Phyllis, and Phyllis. And this is a buzz that's been going all over the world. Thank you. And we'd like to also, I just want to note that, you know, thank you again to Mass Humanities for this wonderful program. I saw someone from Mass Humanities. If you're here from Mass Humanities, please raise your hand. There we go. And um, also as we continue, right? Yes, Mass Humanities. As we continue in this right, we are really together. We just, these lines have not always been here. Please continue with this train on Friday, July 5th. There will be an Amherst reading at the South Common, and that will be from 3 to 5 p.m. And we have some of these organizers here with us, Dr. Carly Tartico. So with that, we extend an abundance of gratitude to each of you for joining us on this special evening, and we send you off with love. Thank you. And safe journey through the weekend, and don't give up the fight.